All right. Uh, let's see here. Yes. Gonna, oh, we we got some people from overseas in uh, in here as well. All right. Well, uh, let me go ahead and get the screen share started, and we will get going here. Because uh, as I was mentioning to Dennis, we've got quite a bit to cover here today. You wouldn't think audience miking would be such a dense topic, but it really, it really can be. So let's get going here. Uh, let me make sure everybody's mic's muted here. Okay, we got some more people coming in. I'll have to watch for them. All right, here we go. This is what we got. Are you ready? We're going to talk about uh, miking audiences and ambience for live sound and for recording it right now because, as you all know, we are all recording engineers as well. Uh, so we have to take care of that uh, in this day and age. So I'm get my chat window sorted out here. Stand by. Come down here. All right, so we're going to talk about it from these angles today. Uh, crowd or audience miking, whatever you prefer to choose uh, to call it. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the techniques for doing it, also some of the challenges in doing it, because there are plenty. Uh, we're going to talk about ambience miking and the techniques and challenges for that as well. These two things actually go hand in hand, and many times it's actually really hard to separate the two, but they both have their role uh, in live sound, especially in the post process. Uh, and then some considerations for post mixing, you know, kind of, I'm going to show you some ways to uh, capture. Uh, Is somebody in there? Capture your, capture your mic positions uh, in a really cool way so that you can uh, get a sense of how far they were away from the PA system or from your source, uh, etc. So I'm going to be a little clunky here while I'm still working the door. So hang in there with me. Uh, and then we're going to obviously have some considerations for surround and uh, all kinds of stuff like that and uh, object-based mixing as well. That's what OBM stands for, for object-based mixing, because that's when it gets really kind of tricky. I, I, you know, it's one of those things that's easy to gloss over, but boy, it gets tricky with object-based mixing for post, depending, especially depending on how they're going to fold it down or if they're going to fold it down. So we'll cover all of that today. All right, so we got to define the miking agendas. That is really one of the most important things you can do right out of the gate is figure out what it is you're actually trying to do with these microphones. So for audience microphones, usually audience microphones are going to be aimed directly at the audience uh, in the near to midfield. Okay, for rock and roll, we usually see them up around the stage, pointing out at the audience, uh, things like that. Right, but for ambience miking. This is almost always mid room. Now, you know, we'll start right out here. You know, of course, there's going to be audience in the ambience mic, right? Uh, so what makes this an ambience mic versus an audience mic? And, and I say it's the placement of it. It is the fact that it is far out into the room and it is actually capturing room tone into that microphone. OK, and these can be when these are handled right, these can actually do some great, great things to your mix. Uh, in post, especially if the mix coming out of the PA was really good it, or, or even above average, I'll say, do that. You can actually uh, use a lot of this ambience microphones, miking in your mixes and have it really come to life, really, really sound good. Uh, we're going to talk about two different kinds of capture. We're going to talk about acoustic capture. Uh, and by this, I mean, there, there really is no uh, signal to noise problem from a PA system, right? There's no PA system involved here. This would be like uh, capturing an orchestra or a pops thing where there is no sound reinforcement per se. So in those situations, obviously, the the amount of, I, I, you know, we want to think in these terms, the kind of signal, which is audience, to noise, which would be not audience, uh, we, that's going to be very high, or not really high, but much higher in the acoustic capture uh, than it is in the other types of capture. So I'm just going to mute some people up here. If you haven't muted your mics, guys, please mute your vocal mics. All right. And lastly is electroacoustic capture. And this is the one that, you know, we're all kind of dealing with in this day and age for the most part. Uh, and in this situation, you know, you got significant challenges of uh, audience, uh, meaning signal, to noise PA system. PA system 
is almost always going to overwhelm your um, your audience mics when the PA system is on. Uh, and in addition to it, you know, depending on where your mics are going to be, you know, you're going to have propagation issues into those microphones as well, meaning that PA system is going to be late into those microphones, right? So we'll, we'll you know, it's, we're going to deal with a lot of that today. We're going to hopefully get you thinking a little more like a post engineer when you're actually placing these mics because it actually helps you while you're doing your shows as well. Okay, so uh, this is the first one we'll talk about here. Placement matters. You know, if we're going to do mics up around these PA systems, etc., placement matters, and this distance matters. Now, I'll start by saying the distance that the, that this is from the PA is not that big a deal. If it's 10 feet, 20 feet, 30 feet, 40 feet, honestly, I don't care. But if you have an array of microphones in this plane along the front of the stage, the goal is to try to keep them all the same distance from the PA system. Right? There's nothing worse than pulling up three or four audience mics against a dry mix and having the arrival time from the PA into those audience mics all be different. It makes it where you just can't use very much of them until you can get them realigned, right? So phase is important here. And really, when you start thinking about phase here, you want to start thinking about phase. What happens if I collapse all of this down to mono or stereo? What is going to happen with all these microphones? Because I'm going to have all this different arrival time in the microphones against a single arrival time from my mix coming off the console, right? So you have all kinds of potential for time problems here, big time. All right, take note of the polar pattern, right? Both of the PA system, especially in this day and age, and the microphone, right? And use this to your advantage. You're, uh, you're never going to get all of the PA out of the microphone. That's just not going to happen in this day and age right now. I'm sure Isotope is working on cha uh, this challenge for us to get it fixed, but uh, not quite there yet. But, you know, if a, a hypercardioid microphone works better in this situation, by all means, use it to keep as much of that PA out of the microphone as you can, right? Uh, so, you know, take note of your polar patterns. Know them and know how they work and, and use them to your advantage. And then finally, which we're going to touch upon here today, try to use an FFT to delay locate those microphones from the PA. I'm actually going to give you a method for doing this today where you can do it in just really, really fast time. You don't have to take a lot of, a lot of your setup time during the day to do this, and it is a tremendous help when you get to post, okay? All right, so if we're talking about micing considerations for ambience, these are mics out in the uh, in the building, right? Uh, out you're typically near the mix position. You know, you the key here, especially if you're using XY or even ORTF, is to ensure that these two distances are the same. Ensure that you are directly between these two arrays. And again, you're trying to eliminate smear, right? When we add these two microphones together. That is the ultimate goal here. So again, you can use FFT to do this and get this kind of tweaked in if you want, or you can just, you know, capture the times and leave it up to the post guy to try to try to sort it out. Either way, you know, you, you want to pay attention to this, right? Don't just throw the microphones up and expect that you're going to get a good result in post, because I can tell you, at, at, speaking as someone who's mixed a fair amount of post, it is a challenge when you come get these kind of microphones in and you have no idea where they were in the room. Uh, really good to use uh, XY or even ORTF here uh, at worst. I, and I'll, I'll fully admit I've used split pairs here, meaning, you know, where there's 10, 15, 20 feet uh, uh, between them. But, you know, again, try to pay very close attention to the distancing from the competing source, right? In this, in this instance, it's the PA system we really want to care about. We really don't care how long the audience takes to get to these microphones. We care really about the PA, okay? Uh, and if you're, uh, you know, if you're using these mics, uh, you know, as kind of distant audience, so keep this in mind, this, this would be kind of a, a way you could think about this. If you were using this as an ambience mic, I probably would aim it at the PA. You're gonna count on the audio that's coming from that PA to add something to your mix in post. But if I wanna capture distant audience, then I'm gonna turn those mics around and aim them away from the PA system, get as much of the PA in the null of the microphones as I can. I'll probably use cardioid in that situation and point them out at the audience, out at the distant audience, probably out in the corners or you know, just inside, of the, inside or outside of the corners 
uh, to try to get some audience in there. Is that making sense to everybody there? Just give me a thumbs up. Make sure you can hear me here. I, I, I always get nervous like this uh, that I don't have my mic on or something. Somebody give me a thumbs up that you're actually hearing my audio. It's all good, man. Okay, good. Thank you. Dennis, I'm counting on you, man. Don't forget that. All right, so let's talk about some other micing considerations here. You know, obviously, we're just talking about regular condenser mics or dynamics. You know, I, you know, I, I won't say it doesn't matter. Every, everything matters in the right context. But, you know, I will, t you know, if I'm in post, I will take more dynamic mics over less condenser mics. You know, I, I, what we need in post a lot of times is just more of them. Uh, so, you know, keep that in mind. I, I, yeah, for me, I was mentioning to Dennis before I started, uh, we started the thing today. I've been kind of using Neumann TLM 103s uh, as a large diaphragm uh, in audience and ambience capture for quite a few years now, combined with some Neumann shotguns, some Neumann short barrel shotguns. Uh, but I also put up this microphone as well, uh, which is a DPA surround mic. It's a 5100 mobile surround mic. And the idea here is that you want to kind of consider a multi-channel microphone for your surround ambience and audience capture so that you can kind of future proof a little bit your recordings right uh, you know even though we did all these single mic captures on the all the Tom Petty stuff I always did a surround capture as well and as you're gonna see here and I didn't think that what I'm gonna show you I didn't think of this till much later uh, but I it, it really turned my thinking around in terms of how you could actually use this mic so uh, in the normal course of the day, you're going to have this aimed at the PA system with the surround mic portion of it aimed to the back of the room, right? You're going to place it kind of in the midfield. Usually this is out in the audience. Uh, give you an example. When we did Fenway Park uh, with Petty, as, just as it turned out, the front of house position was almost dead center in the stadium. It just worked out that way. And we put this thing up about 20 feet in the air, 15, 20 feet in the air, dead center of the stadium and you should hear the recording of this microphone in that setting. It was spectacular. You could probably, I mean, you know, nobody would ever release it, but you could do a, a surround release of just that microphone and it would be pretty doggone good. It was really impressive. Ryan, uh, the guy who mixes a bunch of the live Tom Petty stuff, he was kind of freaked out by how cool that sounded. Uh, you really want to pay close attention again to the, uh, the arrays of your PA in your left front and your right front here. You wanna make those arrival times as close as you can so that again, when you get into post and you start adding the left right mix uh, to it, you're going to, you know, it's gonna be in phase. It's gonna actually add. It's not gonna take away from that close mix. All right, so it's a, it's a fantastic mic. You know, you can, there are tons of multi-channel mics now, but you know, tracks are cheap. Hard drive space is cheap. Typically, for most consoles, channels are cheap. Find a way to do multi-channels capture in your multi-tracks, guys, especially if it's going to go into any kind of archive, okay? And then finally, the part of the reason, uh, uh, the main reason this mic works so well uh, in this kind of capture, whether it's ambience or audience, is that the phase response of all of the microphones, because they come from a central location, is really good. It'll collapse down to mono, just fantastic. You know, there won't be, there's hardly any cancellation uh, in it, except for up in the very, very, very top frequencies, right? Because of some offset and time, arrival times. But overall, it is a fantastic fold down from this kind of microphone. All right, so this is kind of what we were doing on, uh, this is what I've been doing for the last few years uh, of capture uh, out here. So uh, there's kind of two different agendas going on here. Uh, and this is, believe it or not, this is what I'm doing for a two dimensional capture, right? Hey, Robert, uh, can you make that bigger? We can hardly see that. Uh, I cannot zoom in on it, unfortunately. So uh, but you'll get a bigger version of it here coming up. So hang in there. Uh, I just wanted to give some idea of what it, uh, what it looks like. What, do you, what are you watching on, by the way? A 17-inch Mac. Wow, 17-inch Mac, and you can't see that? Man, it's not like super detailed, but you can zoom in just fine. Yeah. Well, uh, to, just to give well, you... All, all I, I see you, but that that thing is like really tiny, like uh, one inch by two inches up in the upper right-hand corner. Hmm. Is everybody else having that happen? No. no I, have it, I have it on my main screen, and I can zoom in. 
Yeah, you should be. This should be the main part of your screen. The only thing that should be small on your screen is me. Yeah, and that's the way I'm seeing it too. So I'm gonna. I got it. It's a. It was a setting in the uh, in the Zoom that was backwards. Copy that. Copy that. Okay. So let me get a little annotation going here, and I'll try to highlight what's uh, what's happening here. Uh, I'll use some boxes. All right, so uh, as you can kind of see here, uh, sorry, one second. <laughs> Where is it? There we go. All right, so this area is the stage area, obviously, and you can see it's just, I've just shown a stereo PA system there. And that's just an array of microphones that are down there to capture the near field audience, right? And this is uh, just, and don't be fooled by this a little bit. It's not like three microphones are spaced out like this here. It's actually all microphones are sitting essentially on one mic stand and they're they're positioned and pointed out to these different directions, right? Because I'm trying to keep the collapse phase uh, really good on it. So this is a combination of two TLM 103s and a, and a Neumann shotgun. All right, so that's happening on both sides of the stage and that would be considered my near field audience. Okay? And then this pair of mics, and this is an XY set out there, that is considered ambience, right? That is aimed at the PA system. Notice the red side is pointing to the red side. The blue side is pointing to the blue side. And then on top of it, I've got some far field audience in there. So now the thing that should be apparent to you readily is, yes, there's going to be different arrival times from the PA system into all of those microphones. So we are going to have to deal with that in post, no doubt about it, if we want to use a lot of those microphones or pick and choose when we use them. Maybe I don't Maybe I don't have the far field audience in the mix at all, unless there's a big applause or there's a big move moment in a, in a song or something where I want to really charge the audience up into the mix, right? Uh, but you know, again, arrival time from the PA system and spacing of this is a lot more critical than I see most people handle it, okay? Uh, let's see here, one second, let me clear that out. So this is kind of what I, I started thinking about with the uh, ambience mic or the, the surround mic. You know, uh, if you don't know it, I'm, I mean, I'll just say it on Petty, we, we actually had an LCR PA system. So I always had the LCR portion of the microphone aimed at the PA system and it was considered ambience, right? Uh, and then the rear portion of the microphone was doing the far field audience and the back of the hall. And this works fine. Uh, this works, uh, you know, really great uh, in that setting for sure especially if you're going to mix in 5.1 in anything in post. You know, if I was going to be doing anything for video, for sure, I would absolutely be capturing this mic in this manner. But if I was just doing it for stereo, if I knew, if I knew the post piece of it was just going to be for stereo, I actually might consider this, right? Which would be take the LCR portion of that mic and point it to the back of the room and take the left surround, right surround, and point it at the PA system, right? That way you have stereo ambience and three zones of far field ambience. And again, this is all gonna collapse down to mono really, really well. So if I was using that surround mic for strictly for stereo capture, I think I probably would do this, you know? So that's, that's kind of a, a way of just kind of adapting that mic to your given situation. And, and it, again, it kind of speaks to what I was talking about earlier, which is if you have some sense of what's gonna happen in post, it can drive what you do, right? It can drive how you put up the mics, where you put them, uh, et cetera. Okay. Yeah, I got a question for you, Robert. Yeah. And I, you might cover, you might get into this in a little bit, but the the ones that are facing the PA, obviously, you're going to delay those uh, for the arrival time. And are you delaying the ones that are facing backwards as well, or not so much? In the situation you're looking at right here, I probably would only delay the front ones, right? The ones that are facing the PA. And, and again, you know, you, you kind of have the choice, especially if you have other audience mics up, of whether you want to delay that, that pair of mics or not. Because, you know, having that little bit of echo in there and having it kind of down in your mix will give a much bigger sense of depth to your mix. It'll, it'll sound like it was recorded in a much bigger place, right? So, you know, it's not a given that I'm going to take those mics and absolutely delay them right back to the PA. I might. I, I definitely would if those were the only two mics that I had for audience and ambience. But if I've got near field audience 
and far field ambience, I may not necessarily delay that all the way back to the PA. I may shorten it up a little bit, try to clean it up a little bit. Yeah, you yeah, follow me there? Thanks. Yep, absolutely. Thanks. All right. So here's kind of what I try to get a sense of what we actually do in post here and try to visualize this to some degree here. So uh, this is kind of what I came up with. So when kind of when you're in the studio, you're kind of looking at the venue backwards, right? Uh, it, forget what left and right are, whether they're left or right, but just think in terms of time here. You know, obviously the first thing that's going to come out of the speakers is the close mics that you've that you've recorded, those close tracks. And then the next thing that is going to hit your ears are the is the near audience, right? And all of its its PA bleed in it. It's going to come up, you know, 10, 15, 20, 25, 30, 35 milliseconds late, depending on um, you know, your placement and the size of the venue. And then later on, these other microphones are gonna to start to show up there as well, right? You kind of get a sense of uh, them all being in there. So obviously, you know, if you just turned all of these on and turned them up, uh, you know, it's gonna be a mess, right? It's gonna sound very messy. And what we end up having happen in post a lot, right? It, it, when we, I, I, I can almost hear it on the records that didn't really effectively deal with this or weren't able to deal with it. Because what ends up happening is the audience mics gets pushed very far down, right? Because it's kind of disruptive to what you're trying to create mix-wise. It becomes destructive to it. So uh, the other piece of it is if you have somebody that's going to do overdubs, right, on their recording, well, now you've got conflicting audio in the PA audio that is coming into those microphones and the, the close mic or the, the console audio. Now you might have a console vocal track that will not sound like the vocal that is in your ambience and audience mics. And more often than not, when people resort to doing that, they just end up pushing the audience mics farther and farther and farther away, you know, and the whole thing ends up being kind of dry and uneventful. That's, I, I, you know, not to go on the crusade here, but that's to me is why, you know, archiving and multi-track night after night after night is so important uh, to kind of the legacy of music because you can capture the actual performances without need for a lot of overdubs. You could just got to go find the one that was the one, you know, whereas, in, you know, 30 years ago, you might only record two or three shows on the tour. So those were going to be the recordings, you know, regardless of how good they were. Right. So in this situation, all of this stuff is going to collapse down to a, I, I call it a flattened mix. I, I think of it like almost like Photoshop here. Uh, where you know you're going to flatten down this thing and you know that the arrival times of these things are important uh to get them right because you're going to create kind of a 2d space and believe it or not it's 2d x x axis left to right y axis meaning the height is zero always zero so it's still 2d we just don't have any y axis here and we definitely don't have any z axis in a stereo mix right okay so here's an example of it. These are the actual tracks you're going to listen to today. So uh, if you notice, and I'm, uh, up at the top, that's a, actually a bass drum, believe it or not, but it's working from a, a stem mix of drums. Uh, so it comes across as two kick drums. It's a kick drum left and right. Uh, so that's a bass drum. And here you see uh, distant uh, ambient mics. Get this out so you can read. Oops, sorry. Uh, so. Let me just annotate a little. So this is the bass drum that's coming in the stem. This is a distant set of ambient mics, right? And this is actually four channels of the surround mic. I, I didn't get the fifth channel in the uh, in the screen capture there, but you can see already, right? So the the distant ambient mics are very coherent. By the way, we're working on a grid here of about 10 millisecond spacing. So uh, if I were to zoom in on that, the, that microphone, um, that pair of microphones there is probably about 120, maybe 130 milliseconds away from that bass drum impulse that is happening off the console there. All right. Sorry, I got to let some more people in here once second. And uh, Let's see, is that right? Actually, let me check something. I think I might have my slides backwards here. One second. No, I do have them backwards. I'm sorry. I misread, misrepresented what I just told you. So let me back up one. Uh, so bass drum is the top pair of impulses. The next two pair of impulses, three and four there, are the distant 
uh, ambience, and the four right below it are audience mics right near the stage. Okay, and those are about those come out about 25, maybe 30 uh, milliseconds away from that original bass drum. Now keep in mind, uh, and you, you this is why I, I try to get people to to do this accurately, is that you can't just kind of look at you can't just kind of put up the microphone in this day and age underneath the PA, look up and go, that's about 20 feet, right? Because there may be latency in the PA drive. So compared to the, the, the dry mics on your console, by the time they get through the PA system drive, out of your console through the PA system drive, you might have another 10, 15 milliseconds on it. In my case, I probably added another 17, 18 milliseconds total to it in its throughput by the time it got out of the PA system. So the audio arriving at those microphones is actually kind of late, right? So you can't just, can't, especially in the digital age, you can't just use sightline distance uh, to get it. You can use the sightline distance to get the distancing accurate microphone to microphone, but in terms of logging it for the post guy, you're gonna, you know, that's gonna be troublesome. You're, you're probably gonna give some inaccurate information there. Okay. You following that there? Kind of see that there? So let's take a look at the surround mic against the bass drum. And I'm going to let you hear this in a minute so you get a real sense of it. So what you see here is the top mic or the top track there is actually the vocal mic. Okay. And then the two uh, impulses are the bass drum again coming out of the stem. And then look how coherent that is in that surround mic. Right. I mean, that's just perfectly coherent there. You can still see a little bit of offset in those peaks. Uh, but, you know, that's going to collapse together really, really good. So, you know, it, it, all five of the channels there are going to do great in fold down. Okay. All right. So let's, uh, let's see, where are we here? Not quite there yet. So let's have a listen to this. Let's see if I can do this. It was kind of uh, tricky setting up all the simulations here today. So... All right, so uh, you guys are going to have to give me a read on volume here. Let's see, I've got that done. Let me just do a little test. That's that. That's that. That's that. Okay. All right, you should hear a bass drum here. Do you hear that? Okay, so believe it or not, that was the dry bass drum. Because uh, I have, I had some room simulation to it just coming off the console. All right, so I'm going to let you hear each one of these a little bit, and then we'll hear them all together. So that was the dry bass drum. Here is just the stage ambience or stage audience. And there's no filtering or anything on this right now. This is just the microphones as they were recorded. This will be the 5.1. So that's out at the house right now. Is that enough volume for you guys? I think it sounds pretty good. Okay. All right. So now where it's going to get tricky here is when we put all of these together, right? Because we, we haven't done any assessment of time or anything like that, right? So I'm going to open up the bass drum here and then we're going to open up the other microphones. Here come the surrounds. Now, when I was out on Petty, people used to always ask me, why do you do your line check with the PA system on? This is why, right? I'm giving that post engineer a fantastic impulse to realign these microphones if he needs to do it. Right? I mean, you, you're looking at them on screen right now, so he could actually just go into Pro Tools and do it. He wouldn't really have to do a lot to do it. But you know, if you want really accurate times, I'm going to show you a way to get it. But you can see that you would not be able to use very much of those microphones all together, right? I mean, if we went to, let me see if I can get here for a second.
actually I'll wait to do that so let's let's do some alignment here now I'm gonna kinda of fake it here today because I'm gonna do the alignment actually on the console but it's the same kinda of process alright so um, matter of fact maybe I'll go to a camera here standby let's see if I can do this Come on, Mr. Camera. Play along today. There he comes. Come on. Yeah. He's doing any funny. I mean, like, on the road, so he's got anything like that. Scott, your mic is pretty bad right now. I'm having trouble understanding you there. Is that better? That's a little better, yeah. Uh, who's doing your recording on Patty? Who's doing what? Who's doing the first one you're recording? I'm sorry, I'm not picking up what you're saying there. It's too garbled. Who's doing the recording? Uh, this was, uh, yeah, I, I'm assuming you're asking who who was doing the recording? Who's doing the recording on Teddy? Yeah, that was me. So this was off of two, well, there was actually three Pro Tools records taking place out there. A primary, a backup, and a stem record. So you didn't have somebody operating Pro Tools? No. Oh, no. 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 Uh, okay, I'm going to have to use the overhead camera today. Let me... All right, so uh, this is, it's way down here, unfortunately. It's way down on the left side. This is the, that drum stem that is coming in here. Uh, these purple channels are the uh, audience mic. So this is the 5.1 mic. This is the distant ambience. And this is the stage mics. This is three stereo sets there. So two TLMs and one shotgun. All right. So the first thing, you know, if we're going to do this, if we're, let's just take the approach that we're going to mix in stereo. We want this all to come back and, and collapse and be supportive of what we're doing drum wise. Well, the first thing we want to do then is move the mix closer to the distant ambience, right? Uh, the, the, the mix you're going to be creating is going to be arriving first so we can push it back in time uh, to get it with the ambience, right? All right, with that surround. So I'm going to turn off the stage for a second. So here we have just the uh, ambience, uh, or the 5.1 and the distant ambience. We got the bass drum. So I've got it set up like this. When you see these lights start flashing, that means the delay time is in for the music to push it back to the surround mic, okay? So I'm just gonna do it while it's rolling so you'll be able to hear it, okay? You can clearly hear the echo in there, right? Here, I, I mean, you would clearly be able to use that now, right? Okay. So here's no ambience. Okay. And then with the ambience. Okay. All right, let's do the uh, let's do the stage mics now. The stage mics are going to sound way out of time now. They're actually arriving first now, right? So we've got to delay those back to that mix as well. And now you can you can hear the entire room tone start to add up, now, right? Now, granted, we would probably high pass all of these microphones for certain. Let's try to, get, to settle that down a little bit. Now that's all audience and ambience basically in time with the bass drum and 
high passed up to about 80 hertz. Okay, so, you know, as you can tell, that's very usable once we do that, right? I'm going to actually give you some examples of it with uh, all of the music playing here as well in just a second so you can get a real sense of it, okay? Quick question, Robert. Yeah. Only 80 hertz? Well, maybe maybe more, but, you know, I, the thing is, Gear, when you get these things actually in time, they can actually help your mix, right? So, you know, I, I'm not near as heavy-handed on it when I do that. I might want to leave some of that bottom end in there. I mean, it can sound great on the on your mix. Really, it, it comes down to, is it destroying the intelligibility of the bass guitar? Things like that. You know, that's where I'll kind of manage that. And, you know, I may end up having to run it up higher than that because of that, but who knows? But it also speaks directly to the better sounding, the more clarity there is in that PA mix, the more you'll be able to use it in post. If it's a if it's terribly out of balance in terms of frequency and instrument content, it's just really hard to use those microphones anytime other than when it's just audience coming into them, right? Good, thank you. Sure. All right, let's uh, let's see where do we go next. Actually, let's just let's go listen to some music with that in and out. Uh, I'll throw up the rest of the band here. Try to get something. Keep in mind this is just stem mixes, so. Be nice to me now. Uh, let's see here. So that's out. Let's see what we got here. All right, so this is just. Uh, I'll, I'll just do the guitar and the drums for now, just to highlight. All right, so I'm just going to open up the stage mics now. All right, I'm going to close those down and open up just the surround mic, just the long distance. So, I, I mean, I didn't change level for the audience there and the ambience at all. All we did was do the alignment uh, to get them back to the, ba to the band mix a little bit, right? So you can hear it just becomes much more usable. Now, now I'll totally grant you these are probably much louder than I would have them in an actual mix that I was doing in post, but it's there to just demonstrate the point, right? Are you guys grabbing onto that? Is it coming across the, the old interwebs okay? Dave Stegel, you have your hand up. How polite of you. Go, my man. Yeah. Um, what kind of considerations are you making for video world when you're doing this on your live console? If you're putting all of that, um, all that delay on your main mix. Yeah. It ha it then it's not going to work unless you can do it unless you can re offset it to video. Yeah. It doesn't work in that situation. Yeah. That's where you just have to come back to <laughs> reality a little bit and pull those mics down the, the echo is not going to work there you know i mean unless i mean if you're doing video for post then no big deal we can relay yeah, post it is not an in. issue I'm, but I'm live thinking, broadcast yeah yeah no, hard, or hard live streaming or, or whatever yep yeah yeah it's that's the big challenge isn't it i mean it's yeah, almost like you need some way to well, I mean, we've we've said it for ages, you know, you need to have some way to delay video back to the audio at that point. Well, now. you know, I usually find that the video systems, they usually have delay inherent in their system. They do. Usually two or three frames um, from the systems that I've worked with. But 
two or three, you know, three frames is going to give you about a hundred milliseconds to play with. So, right, right. Yeah. So, I mean, you can get close. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've actually said it to a video guy before. Nope. Keep adding some processing. Keep adding more processing. <laughs> right. We're almost there. I don't care whether you use it, just get it in the chain. <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah, but for live broadcast, that's always going to be the challenge there, right? Uh, Scott Taylor, go. Um, just so I can catch up here again, you're take, which, how far back are you taking? You're, you're, you're taking your actual audience mic to send it to the NPA, you're taking everything, all your mics back to those? Because you're, you're taking like straight, your audio, your straight audience mics. Um, Delaying them to your main PA, and then you're taking all your mics that you have out in front of house and delaying everything back to those mics or to the PA. Yeah, the first the first step, at least in this example, the first step was to delay the close mics back to the longest distance microphones. Right, get that get that delay time done first, and then bring your close mics back into it as well, because you'll need to to delay those as well. You follow that? Yeah, kind of. You have a drum sub, too, that you're aligning everything to, right? Uh, you... That has no bearing here. Yeah, this is just this is just the, the recorded drum subgroup against those ambience mics. Okay, I guess what I was trying to say was if you've got, like, a drum sub on stage and you typically, like, delay your PA back to your drum sub, mm -hmm. wouldn't you take your mics and do that as well? Uh, it's almost irrelevant at that point. I, I won't say irrelevant, but you're going to capture that time when you figure out how how long it takes for audio to get out of the PA and arrive at a stage mic or at an audience mic. Okay. Right. That, that, that's kind of what I'm getting at. If you're taking the and delaying the PA back, well, you're just creating the, a longer throughput time for a close mic to get out of the PA system, right? So you can't you can't just physically look at the microphone and look at the PA and go, it's going to be 20 milliseconds till I hear audio there out of the PA. You know, it's, it's not, it's going to be longer than that for those close mics because you've delayed the PA back to the, to the acoustic source, right? So those, those close mics are going to be longer getting out of the PA compared to when they came out of the console, right? Right. Okay. Right. Compared to when they got recorded. Right, they're going to record it times zero essentially, and then take X amount of time to get out of the PA system. Certainly in the digital age. Yeah. You follow me there? Yeah, I think so. Uh, Christopher Dean, go. In a world where streaming might be a component of all live events going forward, how can you, in time, use these audience mics to enhance the streaming? In that situation, unless you can lay back video to the audio, you're probably not going to use much distant microphones, much distant miking. You're not going to use very much of it in the mix, that's for sure. But that said, you could use it, right? I, 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 and I have done it where, you know, I certainly at a time where I was mixing where we didn't have the ability to digitally manipulate the time, then, you know, the, the distant mics just became the echo structure in the room, right? So... Yeah, I mean, I would still use them, but just not very prominently. Otherwise, it's going to make it's just going to make it an echo fest in your mix, right? You got to treat that just as if you were adding echo to your mix. How much of it would you actually use? Right? A very small portion won't go a long way there. Does that make sense to you? Yes, thank you. Great. Great. All right, let's carry on. Um, I got some other stuff to show you here for sure. So one of the ways I do this, uh, and I, I started doing this right at the end of my time with Petty, uh, was finding out a way to quickly capture these times, right? I mean, look, my PA guys don't have time to go up and, you know, try to, you know, use a laser to measure microphone to PA, and it's not accurate anyway in the digital age. So how do we get some accuracy on these times but between the time these mics are recorded and the, uh, you know, the time they're captured, you know, the, the propagation times that's being captured there. And believe it or not, you can do, actually do this with smart. Uh, I'm gonna actually demonstrate this to you today as well. Uh, you know, obviously the, you know, the guys that are gonna lean on this are the post guys. They can make really good use of just a single impulse, right? The kick drum, like, uh, 
you know, I just, when we go into line check on Petty, I would line check through the PA and record it. Once we started line checking and recording, the recorders never came out to record the rest of the night. Every time, every session that showed up in post had a line check in it where you could do audience alignment and then the show, right? So that was certainly the way they were doing it. But if you don't have time to log the times, if you want to log the times and, and give them some real sense of how far these are, there's a really easy way to do it using smart. So let me get there. And especially in the day of the age of digital consoles now, um, you can do this with a sequence, right? You can just, uh, you know, record a snapshot that just goes and captures all of these microphones for you and records them. And then you can uh, bring them back off of Pro Tools into Smart and measure them, right? So that's what we're going to do here. So let me get kind of set up to do it. I'm not going to lie. I, I actually didn't know whether this was going to work the first few times I tried it and was amazed at how well it works. So I'm going to pull this over here so you can actually see this work. Uh, get a little bigger here for you guys. Stand by. Do this. You guys can see those screens, right? There's that Pro Tools screen and the Smart screen. All right, I've got to get to this. That's muted. All right, so this might get a little squirrely sounding here because you're going to hear uh, audio coming out of a PA system here uh, that I have in the room while we're doing this capture. Okay, so hang in there with me. Okay, so, uh, and we're just going to do three microphones today. So I've got three microphones kind of spaced uh, in order to capture some different times here. So let's see if we can make this work here. I think, oops, i got to have the cord ready. So the key to doing this, obviously, is that you want to record your reference noise at the same time. Notice I got four tracks there. The top track is actually the noise. I'm just using noise from the console, the generator off the console. So you want to record that noise, and then you want to record that noise arriving at the microphones from the PA system. Okay? So here we go. Let's see how we do here. Let's see if my sequence works. Okay. Oops. Sorry, I blew it. Stand by for me. All right, here we go. I'm going to put this in record. Actually, I'm going to stop that and undo it. One second for me, guys. All right, so I've got it set up where snapshots uh, happen here to patch these different microphones. Uh, or, you know, turn on different sections of the PA while these microphones are recording. Uh, and then it also is going to marker which microphones we're actually recording here, as you'll see. So I'll try it one more time here. Let's get in record. And then we'll start this. Okay, so just like that, you know, I've captured uh, these three microphones. That could be 10 microphones, 12 microphones, and you could do it in about, you know, 20, 30 seconds, depending on how much you want to capture. Now, the cool part is what happens in playback, right? So uh, I'm gonna, just going to go highlight one of these areas. And remember, there's markers in this, so that helps you do this. So this is the first microphone, and if I hit play here, 
You should see. All right, so you should see that in Smart now. And all we have to do is delay locate that mic. Now keep in mind, that's in playback right now from Pro Tools, right? The noise is going in as the reference and the microphone is going in as the measure. And it's telling me that that microphone is 40.10 milliseconds from the electroacoustic source. All right, so we can keep that one. Now we just go highlight another one. All right, this time we're going to go do... Oops. Stand by for me. There we go. So I'm just going to delay locate that microphone now. Save it. And then we can do the third one as well. So there we have it. Uh, so you have all of the arrival times for all of those microphones, right? Just using Pro Tools, playing back recordings of those microphones. Now, it, the place where you want to kind of be particular about this, if you can do it, if you can swing it, I, I've done it that way in here, certainly because I'm in such a small space. But I would do this in the arena as well. You want to make sure that it's very clear when the left side of the PA is on and when the right side of the PA is on. So, you know, when the left side of the PA is on, you only really want to, well, you're going to be capturing all the microphones, but you don't want the right side of the PA on, right? And you want to be able to log that very clearly in the tracks that you're recording here. That's why I got the markers in there saying, okay, left side of the PA, let's look at the arrival time to left microphones. Okay, right side of the PA, look at the uh, arrival times to the right microphones, right? The right microphones, house right microphones in the house. And you can have all of those there. It'll tell you down to the microsecond how far away they were, right? Everybody getting that concept there? That way, you, you know, you don't have to spend a ton of time working on this during the day. I mean, you could do this on headphones, you know, not even headphones. You could just do it with the tracks anytime you got a spare five minutes and log all these times. I, I would normally just put all this information in the info area on the tracks. If you look back through the petty archive we were we were doing it manually i wasn't doing it as a as a sequence of snapshots recording or anything like that we were just doing it on a day-to-day -day basis regular uh, but we were recording these times for ryan in the in the post process so he could do it gear you got a question there go uh <clears throat> yes thanks um i didn't quite get the thing about um the markers you did first uh, right let me z see if i can zoom in on that a little bit because i didn't do the markers first the markers are being generated uh, by Pro Tools, or by Venue, I should say. So if you notice, this first marker uh, was, uh, let me see if I can do this. Actually, stand by one second. I'll get a better view of this for you. One sec. Let's get this out of here for now. And we'll go here. Come on, play nice. Okay, so when I'm doing an audience mic capture, as you can see, there's kind of a sequence that runs here. So if I, um, I have it set up as an event. So capture audience mics is my event. When I press function switch 25, it's going to recall these three snapshots right now. 
it's going to recall snapshot left audience ambience mics. When that snapshot is recalled, the left PA system is going to be on. When I capture right, the right PA system is going to be on. And then the final one is to stop the capture, right? And in, in that process, all of those microphones are being recorded at the same time. But the thing that happens along with it is I have a marker being sent out for every one of those uh, recalls, right? So when I recall left, it actually puts a marker in there, which I'll try to get it back for you here now. I can get the Pro Tools window back. Let's see here, one sec for me. Um, test. Yeah. <laughs> I got so many windows up right now, it's not even funny. Oh, there it is. So notice that those marker names match these three snapshot recalls, right? Marker, marker. And that makes it very easy to just select a piece of audio. Like if I click here and then shift select the next marker, it will grab just the left PA system, right? And you can get it quickly. Is that making sense to everybody? I know it looks really complex, but man, once you get this set up, I mean, you could capture audience mics, I mean, a number, of, well, I mean, we were capturing how many channels? One, two, three, six, 11, 13, 15 audience mics, in, you know, in a matter of about 15, 20, 30 seconds, you know. That was good. Thank you. No, I, um, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So I have this uh, whole process built into my template. I know we have talked about template work in the past, but things like this are built into my template. All I got to do is make sure audience mics are plugged into my channels that are labeled audience mics on my template. And this is good to go. Make sure I'm unmuting the right matrices for the PA, but I almost always do the same matrix drive as well. So uh, if I can do that. Okay. So hopefully you get that. You know, you can also record, uh, you know, you can just set up a microphone and record a slate if you want to do it as well. Anything that will give people information in post, because as you're going to see here, this info in post is really important. All right, so let's go back to this now. Get out of annotation. I'll leave that up in case you guys want to screen capture that. Okay, so let's take a look now at some of the challenges in post, all right, because this is where it gets really interesting. So electroacoustic and acoustic uh, challenges here. So now we're moving into a little bit of 3D audio, right, where we have audio that's going to happen behind us. We, we're kind of incorporating the Z-axis now. So in 5.1, we actually, you know, in this situation, you wouldn't want to collapse these down. You know, you're going to want to leave that 5.1 mic kind of in the listener's position, right? And the thing with electroacoustic capture that we're always battling is that the PA system is always in these microphones, right? So, you know, unlike in the, the flattened version of stereo where we might just run up audience when we need it to create excitement, in a surround capture like this where we're going to go into post and present something in surround, maybe it's for video, uh, most likely it's for video, we're not going to be turning up and down that 5.1 mic right? We're going to try to find a position for it that works, uh, that we can leave on. Now, uh, we might take the front half of it, the LCR portion of it, and delay back to that a little bit. That might make some sense there. And that way you still have uh, the rear surround uh, propagation times in play. You know, I, I, I would be inclined to do that most likely. But, it, you know, in these situations where you have a 5.1 bed and then you're trying to support it, with other microphones, you know, it, it can get really dicey in terms of phase, especially if you don't know those arrival times at those microphones. I'm telling you, it's the it's the key that unlocks everything. If you can if you can know those arrival times for the the damaging source, the electroacoustic source into those microphones. If you can get that logged and get that under control, especially in, when we're at in DAWs now, where we have you know, we have a grid that we can put up in milliseconds, microseconds, whatever we want it to be. You can really get a sense of where those microphones are and how much you need to move them, right? Uh, especially if you know where to look in the first place. Oops. 
Okay, so let's take a look at an acoustic capture. Uh, we're going to work our way toward object-oriented mixing here. So this is really interesting to me. I, think. I, I always get fascinated by this. So in an acoustic capture where we don't have a PA system in play, right? we just have an acoustic source, meaning the orchestra in this situation, then it's really kind of all, all bets are off. You know, we can do all kinds of great things in surround here because, you know, our signal to noise ratio is actually going to be really good here, right? We're going to have a good amount of audience compared to the orchestra bleed in those microphones. It's certainly going to be better than if we had a PA system in play, right? So, uh, you know, again, this is kind of can kind of dictate whether you're capturing audience or ambience. So in this situation, you know, you might, you, you know, you might want to be able to, to do all kinds of stuff here, I'll capture all kinds of distant microphones uh, without too much trouble, especially if you're going to do it in surround, right? If you're going to, if you're going to, if your post is going to be in surround, then this becomes much, much easier if the listeners are going to be listening in surround, right? Because in this situation, you're just taking those distant ambient mics and you're placing them in the surround speakers. There's no competing audio for them. And, and you're going to try to recreate that space and that listening experience for the listener as if he was in that room listening, right? So this is this can actually be done pretty accurately. You can get a really, really good response from this, it, whether you're doing it in object or in surround. You know, a lot of times object guys are actually working in a X.1 as a bed and then supporting it with other microphones in the in the object speakers. Right, so you can kind of see how this would work here, and it works really, really good. Now, when we when we get to electroacoustic, though, that's where things get kind of dicey. So, uh, in this situation, the roles are really well defined. The the zone and the close mics of the orchestra are mixed to the front field. We're not necessarily going to put the orchestra out into the surround field here. We're just going to kind of recreate the space, right? But when we get to others, it gets a little dicier. So if you look here, this would be like uh, an object-oriented uh, capture here, right? Where we have, you know, this is kind of what we see today, right? Where we can have five arrays across the front for object-oriented mixing, something like Elisa or Soundscape. And then we might have surround speakers that are also going to carry audio here out into the surround, right? Depending on what it is. You know, we have no idea what it's going to be, but there's going to be audio out there. Well, think about what happens in post here, right? All the audio delivered from the speakers ends up in the ambience mics, right? Now, the collapse of all those microphones is really, really a problem, right? If we're going to take this down to mono or stereo, whew, man, you've got some challenges for sure. So, you know, depending on how the, uh, the DSP does the fold down of this, where you, where you could subtract elements from it, because uh, you certainly would want to subtract some of these microphone elements from it if you're going to fold this down to mono or stereo. Uh, this becomes a problem, right? It's a big deal. And I, I don't think we have all the answers for this yet. Uh, cer we certainly don't see some of the trouble coming here. Because uh, here's the, the thing that's really important, right? When the show happened, when the show happened, if there was audio coming out of the surround, uh, maybe it's a, a violin part. Maybe it's a keyboard part. Who cares what it is? There needs to be a coordinate with it, right? We need to know where it came out in the performance when we're in post, right? So let's just, I'll try to annotate an example here just to uh, drive home the point, as they say. So let's say during the performance, this is coming, there's audio happening out of this speaker and, you know, obviously arriving in all of the audience mics as well. Well, if we get to post and we don't, I mean, we're just listening to it as a track there. We have no idea that it came out of that location, right? We would need to kind of know that if we're going to recreate that experience for the listener who is sitting in the middle of that room, that there needs to be coordinate information with that. And I think over time it's going to end up as metadata in the, uh, from the DSP devices to, to record with the tracks where we need to record data as well as the audio, right? Fred, you got a uh, question there? What if you were to attach the mics to the speakers and, and get, the, get the sound from the speaker's perspective? Well, you could, but that's going to, I mean, once you place that microphone in that area now, 
I mean, it's, I mean, it's going to be all audio from that speaker and not ambience. Like if you got, if you set levels for that, for the ambience, right? Where you thought, okay, yeah, I got a good feel for how the room sound. As soon as the audio shows up out of that speaker, it's going to be absolutely overdriving that microphone. Even on, even on a cardioid, super cardioid. Sure, sure. Yeah. I mean, the, think about just the distance and, and volume ratio of, you know, signal to noise there. Signal being, in that case, signal being the audio out of the speaker, uh, noise being the audience. What, what would be the ratio there when there's audio coming out of that speaker? It would probably, you know, be 10, 20. I mean, it would be crazy, right? So yeah, just, you, I don't know if, it was, if, it was, if the microphone was aligned with the cone, so you're basically on the null of the speaker, if that would help any. So you got the null of the mic and the null of the speaker working for you at the same time. If, if the agenda of that microphone was to capture the audio from the speaker source, totally valid. Is that its agenda? No. Uh, no, it's not, right? It's to capture ambience and audience. That, well, I mean, I, I, but, but, but pointing the same direction. I'm not saying pointing at the speaker. Well, I mean, if it was if it was attached to the speaker, believe me, I mean, there's going to be enough amplitude coming out of it. You, you could use pattern control there a little bit to control it. Don't get me wrong. I mean, you, you could do it. Uh, I, 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 I mean, it's funny you mention it because I did this on one rush tour that I did that I recorded for them where we hung audience mics from the the downfill on the PA system as opposed to putting it on the ground. And I was surprised how good it worked. I, I was I, I kind of went into it skeptical, but I thought, OK, well, this is the way that I'm going to have consistent arrival times at the audience mics, et cetera. But, you know, it, it still had suffered from the problem of in the microphone itself, there was way more PA bleed than there was audience. Right. It's it just overwhelmed. It. Yeah. yeah. I just was thinking about the timeline. Though. That's yeah. It, from, from the time perspective, it's right. But I, again, it's it's just counter to the agenda of the microphone. If you were, if you were going to ride those mics at all, rather than just having them at a set level. Yeah, but remember in this surround setting, right, where, you know, what you're seeing right there is what's going to be re replicated for the listener. You know, you're not necessarily going to want to dry out the room when the music is playing there. Right? Well, you know, you wouldn't take them completely out, but, but you yeah. probably I, have push them 15 or 20 you know when it, when the when the pa stopped to get the reaction yeah well yeah and, and again that's kind of what i say you know if this has gone bad you know if we've got a lot of time corruption in these microphones that's what happens we just have to turn them way down when the music is playing and then turn them back up when the music stops but the problem is you know if you're listening in a surround environment now you've taken almost all energy and focused it forward or, you know, whatever is in the surround. You're not in the space anymore. You're just in the surround of the speaker system, right? Gotcha. I mean, if, if you were mixing not live, like if you weren't doing live capture, then it, then it's a moot point, right? I have audio swinging around my head all day long, but because the, there's nothing to compete with. There, I'm not trying to recreate space there. I might be able to meet, recre be recreating some ambience there, but that ambience is going to be recreated in the DSP. It's not captured by microphones. I know it's dicey. It's really dicey. I, 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 I met a couple times with the guys from Netflix to talk this through because we were uh, we were just trying to figure out what's the best way to do this. And I, I don't know that anybody's got the total answer yet, you know. So, the, you know, in terms of timing here, it even begs the question. Let me just go to the next drawing here. So electroacoustic capture, this is the one that's got the big problems here, right? So let's get into the control room and look at it. So the question becomes, okay, well, you see the small black squares, the, that is the captured audio. Do I just place it in the surround speakers? Do I place the audio that was coming out of those in the surround speakers? And then do I place the ambience slash audience mics where they were in the arena? Or do I push them up to the speakers? Because I can, you know, given the positioning available for the object, I can place those microphones right there in the surround mix. But it's an awful lot of echo going on in there, you know. It's a lot to ponder, isn't it? I mean, it really kind of, I don't want to say falls apart, but the challenges become 
really extreme once we get once we stop flattening things and collapsing things back to mono. Now, I mean, here's the bigger issue. Uh, even if we get this sorted out, is like, well, what does you know, Joe Smith do at home when he's listening in stereo versus somebody listening in a in a decoded object mix? What what are each of them hearing? You know, that's that's down to the encode decode process there. You know? I'm sure Dolby's working on it. I'm sure they, I'm sure they have a, a method for it to break down Atmos in this way. Has any has anybody seen any uh, um, webinars or anything on Dolby Atmos for music? You watch anyone? I, I know Avid just did one with Srijesh uh, Nair. I can't. I'm not pronouncing his name correct. We just call him Sri. Uh, but I haven't seen it yet. I got to go back and watch it. I know it's in the library. I can actually put you in touch with Ajit Lyman. He's a VP over there. He's a good friend of mine. At Dolby? Yeah. Yeah, no, I'm already speaking to those guys on a halfway regular basis. So, yeah, no problem. Okay. Yeah, I'd love to hear what Mick, I'd love to hear what they captured uh, at the Crossroad Festivals there, Dennis. That would be really interesting to know. I'd love to know what microphones they used to capture that and how they handled it. That would be some really good insight there. I mean, I'll tell you something. I, I mean, I've asked in the in the port, uh, in the run up to studying this and kind of presenting it. I've asked a lot of different post guys and capture guys what they do. And man, I'm telling you, you could ask ten different guys and get fifteen different answers. So uh, there's hardly any, uh, hardly what I would call a best practices out there on it or a consistency from capture company to capture company. So yeah, Dennis, if you've got information or if you speak to Mick ping him a little bit on it and then share it with us, will you? If he's willing to share. Yeah, it's captured by Guy. Yeah, that'd be good to know. Those guys do great work, so why not? Let's let's find out what they're doing there. That would be really good to know. All right. Well, we're at an hour 20 here. Let's see where we are here. So let's just, even though I said there are no best practices, I thought I would just put together a set for you anyway. Uh, so let me just do that, and then we can chat this out if you want. So if you're archiving, you need to be providing crowd recordings, et cetera, for the mixes. Yeah, I mean, you just have to do it. And I, I think any post guy would tell you, more mics are better than fewer mics. Give me more choices, especially in this day and age where, like I said, we're track heavy, we're, we're track rich. Uh, we're hard drive space rich. It's just not a problem. You know, better to have choices in post uh, than not enough choices. Uh, I have a tendency to try to use, uh, you can use combinations of small, large, and shotgun, but I think try to be consistent with it. I, I tried to use all large diaphragm kind of offset by some shotguns. Uh, I tried to keep the manufacturers consistent, uh, tried to keep the models consistent. Uh, Etc. So, um, you know, for a given agenda, is try to use uh, this, at least the same manufacturer and, and the same mics. Uh, Klaus, I can make these slides available in a PDF to you guys. They won't have the automation in them, but you guys can. Uh, I'll put them up on the website there. Okay. <clears throat> audience miking generally pointing toward the audience at the stage. Right, you want to be those those up there, and if for no other reason, to keep the arrival time of the PA system short, as short as possible. Uh, and as I say here, pay attention to the spacing, pay attention to the back line sources. You know, it's not going to do you any good to put a microphone directly, 15, 18 feet directly in front of a guitar amp. You know, uh, even if it's off axis, it's you're going to be in real trouble there in post. So you want to kind of get them off to the sides, get away from the stage bleed if you can get it. Uh, certainly, if for no other reason than that stage bleed that is coming into the mics will be also be out of time with the close mics, right? Know your pickup patterns. Uh, try to always record a surround mic if you can do it. Uh, you know, they're not that expensive anymore. You can do surround mics very inexpensively and more, and that will help future-proof your, your archive. Uh, concentrate on consistent spacing. We were talking about that. And... Uh, I, I try to always print reference mixes that have audience in them, right? Whether whether it's uh, surround ambience that's been pushed back to the mix, et cetera, 
it's really, really important for you to record reference tracks of your multi-tracks with audience in them. Because, you know, if you talk about an archive that might end up with 150 shows in it, the last thing you want to do is go back and have to build rough mixes in order to preview or review the performances. You know, you're going to rely pretty heavily on that reference mix. And how the audience was on a given night is part of the review process, right? So it's super important to have a reference mix that's got audience blended into it, right? Now, you can't have so much audience ambience mic blended into it that it disrupts the ability to judge the mix. you got to work on the balance of it and get something that's suitable. But don't just post up a dry mix and have that be what you're going to reference to decide which performances you're going to keep and use, right? Because, you know, Murphy's Law dictates that the performance you loved is the one that has the worst crowd on it, right? So, uh, you know, then you end up kind of going into a sweetening mindset of saying, well, let's put some phony crowd in there uh, to kind of juice things up. I, I, I've gotten to the point in my life now where I, can, I feel like I can pick those out of a lineup, no problem. As soon as I'm listening to a live show, I can kind of go, that's a canned audience there. That is not the real thing you know you can you get you do it enough you can start to pick out the the hallmarks of it all right so that's what we got in the lab today for audience and ambience miking i hope that was uh thought provoking at best what do you think guys is this going to change how you kind of do things have you kind of had any epiphanies here No speakers? No one wants to speak? Hands are raised. Oh, hands are raised. Let me look here. So you guys are so polite. Yes. Mike Shapiro, go ahead. Thanks, man. Hey, Robert. Thank you for this. This is going to be very insightful and helpful. Um, do you ever use any omni pickup patterns when you're out in the midfield, or do you mainly just stay directional for phase... I think just, if I was doing purely acoustic captures, uh, then I would definitely use omnis. If I'm wonderful. doing electroacoustic captures, then I'm, you know, I'm trying to fight that battle of keeping the PA system out of the microphones. So, yeah, wonderful. That's, that's my thinking there. Quick question regarding that: um, When I'm doing or orchestral recordings, I usually do like a, a deca tree, yeah, a little bit further back, a, a pair, a space pair of DPA 4006s and then some ambient mics. And what I've been doing is delaying all the way back to the ambience. Yeah. Is that a good thing to do in well, your opinion? And, and just to be clear, you're using the deca tree to record the orchestra, right? That's yes, sir. Of those microphones. Then, then I might do that if it's going to fold down to stereo. Matter of fact, I probably would do that to get some of the echo out of it. If it's going to fold down to stereo. I might not go all the way back to the microphones. But if again, if I was going to present that in a surround format, you know, where where whoever's going to be listening in their living room has speakers behind them, then I probably would not do that. I, I would probably leave that delay there and make it more realistic for the listener, you know, to, to recreate the space a little bit. Wonderful. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Yeah. Great question. Uh, Jim, go ahead. Jim Coleman. How are you doing? I'm good, man. How are you? Thanks Great. for coming. Uh Question on on your uh, your audience microphones. Are you sharing any of those with the monitor console for in your applications? Yeah, they're all available to him. He can pick and choose any ones he wants to use. He usually ended up picking. Uh, Greg usually ended up picking a pair of the TLM 103s that were down near the stage. Okay. Uh, usually, although usually he took the ones that were pointed more to the outside. Right, which was interesting. I, I always thought he would take the ones kind of nearer so that Tom would have some visual reference to what he was hearing. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's what he ended up doing. And now I can give you the horror story of all horror stories about <laughs> using those <laughs> microphones, if you want. And this was on Rush. This this actually happened, and it was pretty. It was it was not funny at the time, but in hindsight, it was really funny. <laughs> so, it was one of the early days of us recording. We were kind of getting our feet wet on how we were going to put up audience mics and ambience mics, and we had shotguns up. And usually with a shotgun, I'll take it up pretty high and try to aim it out across the floor audience, right? I mean, it's, it's kind of up and angled to try to get out to the audience. Well, at some point, the, and, and 
Getty used to ask for those microphones at, in his ears. He was like, yeah, I like the sound of the shotguns. Give me those. They got the least amount of PA in them. So he had those in his ears. But at some point, one, one, on one of the days, the clutch on the mic stand slipped. So it was this, except it went down, I mean, right to head level. Right to head level. Right at, pointed right at, definitely the biggest Getty Lee fan that has ever existed. Because for the entire night, right into that microphone, it was this. Getty Lee! Getty Lee! Getty! The entire night. You know? <laughs> we heard that microphone in post, and it just took down the studio. We were laughing so hard. It was so funny, but... So. <laughs> Hey, thank you for that, Dennis. Yeah, that would be great, man, if we could get some insight from Mick on that. I, I would love to know how he's doing that. I can it, Once he tells us, I'll go back and listen to that and reference it against it. So I hope that answered your question there. So, uh, Jim. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, good. Uh, gear, come on, man. What do you got? Yeah, I was on to inner monitoring, too. Um, and, and I was just thinking, um, what do they do with the – how does he, um, on, on monitors, do the, uh, the latency? thing there and as a side note I do know where you're going to do this presentation again next year oh you do do you <laughs> is it somewhere in uh, Scandinavia yeah. I'm taking it yes, yes. Right. yes. okay so yes. so I passed the audition is that what you're telling me yeah you did <laughs> I have some comments though but we'll, <laughs> we'll work on that later yeah please I'm, I'm open to all insights here uh, in terms of what they were doing you know honestly it becomes more of an issue in digital believe it or not because you have latency in the throughput uh, to the PA system, you know, normally in analog where, you know, the, the trim height of the PA is the propagation time to the microphones, it, then it ends up being relatively close and they can use those in in-ears pretty effectively. But, you know, once you start getting out to, you know, 30, 40, 50 milliseconds of PA to close audience mics propagations there, that can get sticky for a, uh, a monitor use you know I mean you want it to be pretty close so and and there's but there's no getting out of it unless you want to put the microphones up higher and get them closer to the PA just to cut down the propagation but then you're sacrificing audience level at that point you know so yeah it's a it's a dance for sure and I like I said I, it's been made but worse with digital to some degree who else did we have there good question though gear thank you man all right, guys. Well, uh, that looks like that's going to be it today. So thank you for coming. I hope that was uh, that information was useful for you. And look for the replay. I, I'm a little bit behind on posting some of the stuff in the Google Drive, but I will try to get caught up this week, I promise, and uh, get at least a PDF of this presentation up there if you want to use it, okay? All right, guys. Thank you so much. We'll see you uh, next time. Remember, it's two weeks from today. We're not in next Monday. We're in the following Monday, okay? So we'll see you two weeks from today. All right. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, fellas. We'll see you soon. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, Kobe. Robert.